Hi guys, it's Lauren. Welcome to welcome back to my channel. And in this video, I'm going to be telling you guys about the tragedy on the Taconic. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Diane Schuler was 36 years old from Long Island and she had two children. It was 12.58 p.m. on July 26, 2009 when Warren Hance got a phone call from his sister, Diane. However, when he answered, his eight-year-old daughter, Emma, was on the phone instead. She told her father that Diane was having trouble speaking clearly and seeing while she was driving. Diane then got on the phone and said that she had some like groggy vision and she just felt disoriented. He told her to pull over to the side of the road and that he was on his way, but when he got to their last known location, they were nowhere to be found. Now we're gonna go back and discuss what happened leading up to this phone call. Diane and her husband Daniel had been camping for the weekend with their two kids and four nieces at the Hunter Lake Campground in Parksville, New York. They were preparing to head home to West Babylon. Around 9.30 a.m., Diane and the kids left the camp, and this consisted of her five-year-old son Brian, her two-year-old daughter Erin, and the three nieces, eight-year-old Emma, seven-year-old Allison, and five-year-old Kate. They all got into Warren's red Ford Windstar minivan and Daniel followed behind in a truck with the family dog. On the way home, they made a few stops which included McDonald's and a few gas stations. At 11 a.m., they called Warren to let him know that traffic was bad and they were delayed. They were traveling along Route 17, Interstate 86 and 87. However, this is when eyewitnesses have a different story. Several witnesses spotted a red minivan driving aggressively on the highway. This included tailgating, flashing headlights, honking the horn, and straddling two lanes. Other witnesses also saw a minivan pull over to the side of the road with a woman bent over vomiting. Nearly two hours later is when Warren finally got that phone call. Now, I just want to clarify that exactly what happened after this phone call is unknown, but they were able to piece together the best they could based off of the witnesses' statements. So Diane's phone was found by the side of the road. At 1.33 p.m., 911 received two phone calls claiming that a minivan was driving the wrong way up an exit ramp on the Taconic State Parkway. It was only one minute later that 911 got four more phone calls stating that this same minivan was now driving the wrong way on the State Parkway going 80 miles an hour. The minivan went south for 1.7 miles before getting into a head-on collision with a Chevy Trailblazer and that Trailblazer then hit a Chevy Tracker. The whole thing took less than three minutes. Witnesses were kind enough to help pull Diane and the kids from this burning vehicle that had actually rolled over as it was going down an embankment and landed on a grassy median. Seven of the 11 people involved were killed and pronounced dead at the scene, which included Diane, her daughter, two of the nieces, and the three men that were in the trailblazer. This includes 81-year-old Michael Bastardi, his 49-year-old son, Guy, and their 74-year-old friend, Dan Longo. Apparently, the kids were in the back seat without wearing their seatbelts, and they were not secured in car seats either. Five-year-old Brian and the other niece were taken to the hospital, and Brian suffered severe head trauma and many broken bones, but he ultimately survived. Unfortunately, the niece did not. And Brian was actually almost missed by the people helping pulling them out because he was buried underneath his sibling and his cousins. While pulling Diane out, witnesses said they saw a large bottle of vodka broken on the driver's side floor. The toxicology report was released on August 4th by the Westchester County Medical Examiners. Diane had a blood alcohol content of 0.19 with at least six grams more of alcohol in her stomach that had not yet been absorbed into her bloodstream. She also had high levels of THC and must have smoked marijuana approximately 15 minutes prior to the collision. However, Diane's husband and family deny these allegations that she was intoxicated, which I don't really understand how you can deny an allegation when it's not an allegation, it's just factual, but we'll get into 
theories later. Daniel's private investigator, Tom Ruskin, states, Unless you believe that a woman who's like a PTA mom of the year decides this is the day I don't give a damn, I'm going to have eight or ten shots and smoke a joint in front of my kids and nieces, then something else had to happen. The campground's co-owner spoke with Diane before she left, and she said that she seemed 100% sober. A gas station employee did say that Diane came in trying to buy over-the-counter pain meds, just something like Tylenol, and unfortunately they were out of that medication and he said he knows for a fact that Diane was not drunk when she was talking to him. Tom Ruskin said that he interviewed over 50 people who knew Diane and not one single person said that they ever saw Diane drunk. Her family, including Daniel, said that she smoked marijuana on occasion to help with her insomnia However, later on, Daniel's sister came out and said that she actually smoked it a lot more regularly. Daniel wanted to prove that his wife was not intoxicated during this time, so he made a public statement that said, his wife was driving erratically because of a medical issue such as a stroke. The family kind of fed off of this and started throwing out more theories, like she had a pulmonary embolism because of a lump in her leg, or she had diabetes, which it turns out she did have diabetes, but it was just gestational diabetes from her one pregnancy, which is not chronic, by the way. Her youngest child was two years old. They also said it could have been a heart attack or an abscess that had been in her mouth from seven weeks prior, because supposedly there was some type of tooth issue she had. However, all claims of a medical issue were refuted by the autopsy. Daniel intended to retest the fluid samples that they did. However, the medical examiner said that over time, they start degrading, I guess. So no matter what, it's going to show a lower THC and alcohol blood level. In June of 2010, the New York State Police issued their final report after 11 months of analysis. On November 7th, Ruskin announced that the family raised enough money to retest the samples. However, no surprise here, the results came back the same. Investigators ultimately ruled this crash a homicide because of all the deaths that came with the negligent driving of Diane. To this day, Daniel denies that his wife would ever do something like this, and supposedly she was reliable, trustworthy, and honest. Now, there is one more theory that was not mentioned in any of the articles, but I did read it from one of the commenters on one of those articles, and that is about auto brewery syndrome. Now, I have heard of this before, but I'm not 100% sure how to describe it or exactly what it is. But according to some research, it turns carbs into alcohol. Apparently it builds up in your blood and I heard that yeast might have an effect too. And it makes you feel drunk, it gives you the effects of a drunk person and it shows up in a report like that, that you are well above the legal limit of drunkness. <laughs> So thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you just liked it, give it a thumbs down. I don't really care. Subscribe if you're new. Comment down below videos you would like to see next. Let me know what you guys thought on this case. Do you think that brewery syndrome is a possibility? Or do you think that she was driving negligently? I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!